Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is John Stanford. I'm with Selenia. Uh, we're a product and services company in the OpenStack space. And today we're going to go through some uh, high level and low level details of uh, gathering and managing logs and, and kind of some mining of log data. So before I get started, I'll just give you a little background on logging. It's a very long history of logging. I grew up in Wisconsin. When I was a kid, we'd see stuff like this all the time. Um, there's a, a, an equivalent to this in, in the computer, computing domain, right? The first bug ever captured in a, uh, in a system log of some activity. Um, but like many things, um, logging has evolved. Uh, this is actually more like what I saw when I was a kid in Wisconsin. Um, and this is more like what we see today in systems and logging. So there's a, a good range of, of technologies available to you to uh, both aggregate and process logs. Um, and that's a, a giant step forward from the days of jumping around from system to system, trying to find uh, what caused an event and doing you know, mental correlation of events to uh, get to the bottom of, of problems that were occurring in your environment. So um, we all know that you know, complexity is king in the cloud, right? There's a lot of moving pieces, and up and down the stack and sideways, and you know, up and down the hardware stack, we've got you know, all kinds of different things generating metrics and events and a lot of stuff to keep track of for an operations staff running a production scale cloud. So this is the basic end-to-end -end flow that I'm gonna talk about today. And uh, so the, the TLDR is, if you don't want to see a bunch of detail in code, this is what I'm going to talk about. So you know, shipping events via our syslog to Logstash and pushing them into Elasticsearch. Um, the, the high level is you know, we need to do a few things in the, in the various uh, configuration files associated with OpenStack. We need to do a little bit of modification in the our syslog. And uh, from there, we get into Logstash uh, flow of events through their inputs, filters, and outputs, and, and then we'll talk about a little bit about querying that data in Elasticsearch. Before we get too far into this, you know, let's talk a little bit about how logs are structured and, and the standards that might apply. In most of the OpenStack projects, um, there's a close affinity to the RFC 5424, and if you believe the comments in the configuration file by Juno, the current uh, format will be sort of deprecated and they'll be going towards a, a purely RFC 5424 standard. And we'll talk about what that is in a, in a second. Um, an alternate uh, that I threw up there just for fun is kind of the NCSA Apache common log format. That's something you'll tend to see in uh, Apache logs and other web server logs. It keeps track of you know, URL calls or calls in, into the uh, front end of, of, the, uh, of the web server. Um, as I said, you know, project adoption varies today, but, uh, but it seems like things are heading in the right direction. Um, there's a few variants that I'll, that I'll touch on as we go through here, but, but nothing that can't really be worked around if you're using this sort of chain of, uh, of processing where you can you know, patternize uh, these events and, and, and recognize the differences. Uh, however, I mean, when you have these patterns and, and a, a deviation from a standard, it makes it really hard to know for sure that you're capturing all the relevant data. There's always a possibility that something has slipped through the cracks, didn't get caught by your filters, and didn't get put into the right bucket of information. So, you know, until some event occurs where you're actually looking through logs again to, to find, uh, you know, find some specific uh, cause of an event, you may not notice that, that something's slipping through the cracks. So, you know, we try very hard to, to find all those things and, and patternize them, but I think there's a, a real good play in there for some uh, anomaly detection in logs and how you're processing and all that good stuff, which opens up a whole new can of worms, which I hope to focus a lot on this year as we go forward. Um, and then finally, you know, timestamps are, have been the bane of my existence for the last six months at least and probably the last, you know, 25 years of my career. Um, the, okay, so let's get into a bit about what an OpenStack message looks like today. Uh, most of the projects use a format that, that looks kind of like this. You, you have a date stamp. Uh, you'll notice that the date stamp doesn't have a time zone. That's 
not great. Um, you have a process ID that generated, you have a log level. The log levels um, you know, have a, a fairly standard implementation, although uh, there's some audit levels in there that aren't part of the syslog uh, spec. I, I think that's okay. I mean, we know what they're for, and if you process them correctly and they're used consistently, you know, everything should be fine. The program that generated the log, that's really helpful. And in this case, uh, an empty ID. Um, sometimes you'll see instance IDs in Nova, you'll see request IDs in other, other projects. And then the message itself, which is, which is sometimes the most important part. So in this case, I, I truncated it, but it was, you know, we connected to AMQP, Yahoo, I can send messages from a compute node to a, uh, to a controller. Um, so some things we want to do to be able to centralize the processing of these log messages is to go into the Nova config or, you know, sorry, Neutron config or any config uh, relative to the OpenStack uh, projects that support this flag and turn on syslog, use syslog equal to true, set it to true. Um, what happens then is they'll defer logging to syslog and, and if you don't do anything else, you'll end up with a log on your local system that you know, follows the rules that are set up in your rsyslog.conf most likely. Um, in fact, everything I'll talk about is based on rsyslog on CentOS 6.5 here. Um, and uh, the message you'll get is, is roughly this gray part down in the bottom. If you turn on shipping to a remote system, you'll end up with these uh, three bullets up above that are generated by our syslog that tell you that the, the bracket 132 is really the, the log level and, and facility that, that it was shipped with. The uh, date, you'll notice, is even worse than the one generated by OpenStack, and the, uh, the, um, the host name that generated the log event. So um, now we're gonna move into some other things that, that might help us, uh, that I've been exploring. Um, I was really excited to see in Icehouse this flag use syslog RFC format equals true. And, and the thing that really caught my eye was that it's gonna add the app name before the message. Um, I had no luck getting that to work, uh, but you know, it could be me, uh, it could be something in my environment. I'm gonna continue to try it and I'll chase it back into the code base if I can't figure out something locally that's causing it not to work. Uh, the goal is nice because as we'll see in a, in a coming up slide, the, um, the app name would be really helpful for us to categorize these things so that I can tell not just by the host name or the program name where things are coming from, but, but by actually an app name that's included in the, in the message itself. So uh, what I found was that uh, when I tried to turn this on on a Nova Compute node, uh, the Nova Compute service wouldn't start as long as use syslog was true as well. And when I turned use syslog equal to false, then uh, the message that went into the log file looked exactly like the message that uh, went into the log file with this flag set to false. So, you know, again, it could be me, but I'll keep, uh, keep experimenting with that and we'll see if we can chase it down. Um, so, now we'll get into a little bit about how we set up our syslog to ship things. Um, the, the date that we had in the previous message uh, was very minimalist, and, and uh, if you go dig into the uh, documentation on our syslog, you'll find that there are a couple uh, templates that come with our syslog that are really helpful to make that a little more robust. So the action file default template and action forward default template control the format of the messages that go into files when you're putting them locally, or that get baked into the message that gets shipped over the wire if you're sending them uh, over a, a TCP or UDP connection or forwarding them to another server. And, and what we get out of that is a really high resolution uh, date stamp that's in a very commonly understood format. And that'll make things a lot easier when we get down the chain so we don't have to really patternize this, this, you know, this date stamp as you know, year, month, day, hour, minute, second, you know, dot, dot, dot. Um, we should be able to just say ISO format date and, and run with it there. Uh, and we get the host name as we did before. So you'll notice that there's a bit of redundancy. So uh, I, I theorize that this is, um, this is due to the, the origination of the way uh, OpenStack logging you know, ha has, has come to be. And I think that over time, if, uh, if OpenStack decides to move towards using our syslog as the main logging mechanism, 
uh, and I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not, uh, we could reduce some of that redundancy uh, by, by recognizing that our syslog is going to inject some fields into the, into the message that we don't have to capture as, a, as extra work, reduce the code base, simplify everything, make everybody happy. Um, so that's setting up the, these are global settings uh, in your rsyslog.conf file. Um, our syslog typically allows you to specify uh, a sub-configuration file. In fact, it reads everything in conf.d directory by default. Uh, so etsy rsyslog conf, rsyslog.dconf.d. And, and so what we've done in our project is to use that to define shipping. And, and if you recall back to a few slides where we talked about uh, getting the component or the app name in here, this is where I'm doing it. And, and, and so I'll get into why this isn't such a great thing, but it works for now. Um, but let's first walk through what's going on here. We're saying that we want to forward logs over TCP protocol on port 5514 for everything to my server in my lab. And, and the local zero through local six, are, are, I'm mapping upstream to a particular service in OpenStack. Um, there's some benefits in here that are, uh, uh, are fairly obvious if you know what you're looking for. One is if my upstream server is down, this will queue up to a gigabyte of, of logs locally, and then when it detects that the server's back up, it will, um, it will start shipping those logs. Um, I, I'm not really clear on what happens to the timestamp in that case, so I'm going to make sure that I take care of it up, upstream and I'll take it from the message itself, which should have the time step from when it's generated. Um, it might be that it's okay and it gets rewritten here, just haven't had time to explore that. Uh, so anyway, this configuration will get you uh, shipping logs to a central system where you can really start to process them with Logstash. And with Logstash, um, there's a, a, a pattern of input processors, filters, and output processors. Um, can we get a, a sense of how many people have, have played around with Logstash or anything? Oh, good, quite a few folks. So, so this shouldn't be too, uh, too strange to a lot of you. For those of you uh, that this is new to, I'll do my best to walk through it. Um, we can certainly talk afterwards and, and uh, go through some things in more detail for clarification if you want to. Um, the input's very simple. This maps to taking in messages on TCP uh, port 5514, and I'm, I'm setting the type of events coming in on that stream to syslog so that later when I filter them, I know what kind of message it is, and I can process it accordingly. Um, for sake of uh, seeing the end goal, I'm, I'm showing you that the output before I get to the filters, the output is pushing to Elasticsearch, uh, in this case, it's running locally on port 9200. And because of the more recent versions of Elasticsearch and Logstash trying to keep in sync, they recommend that you use the HTTP uh, protocol rather than going natively uh, with the Elasticsearch plugin. So um, that will get you whatever the result of your filtration is into Elasticsearch, which then makes it really nice, uh, and we'll see that a little later, uh, to process that into something meaningful and useful. So the next big piece of Logstash is the patterns. I'm not really big on patterns. I, I wish that technology was advanced enough that I could just say, hey, here's a big test domain of log data. You tell me what the patterns are. But we're not quite there yet. Um, if anybody's really interested in that project, let me know, and, and we'll uh, maybe kick something off. In any case, what we've got here is easier to read from the bottom up. So what I want to do is characterize an OpenStack syslog line, and I do that by a bunch of parameterized fields that map to different patterns in the text. Um, either there are trace messages as well as regular messages, and, and the trace messages tend to span multiple lines, and you know, so there's a lot of work to get uh, all these messages characterized. But, but the net effect is that if I match this pattern, I'm pretty confident that this message came from an OpenStack source. So we'll get into the filters now. So this is the internals of one of my filters that processes a, an OpenStack message into a way that, that I want to store it in Elasticsearch. So first thing I'm doing is checking to make sure that the type of this message came from the syslog source. 
it, it could have come from another input I have in the domain and, and would just immediately you know, fail out and, and maybe not get processed if I didn't handle that accordingly. So I want to make sure that we're really dealing with a source that I think has a good chance of matching this pattern. And so uh, I'm also referencing the patterns directory where I've stored my patterns in a file. And I'm telling it that I want to match an OpenStack syslog line, which we just saw on the previous slide. And when I do that, I'm going to set my timestamp, uh, 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 a received at timestamp for when I got this thing. And I'm also going to add a field keeping the whole message intact. Um, I use that a lot for debugging. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it has value beyond that, but the number of times I've had to go back and go, is this really doing what I think it is? Oh, I wish I had that message field that had everything before it got processed. Um, I, I tend to leave it in there as long as space isn't a huge constraint. So once I get that, and if I don't end up with a parse failure uh, in my list of tags, then I'll move on to continue filtering. If I end up with a parse failure, I'll do some cleanup. I may pass it on to something else that takes another shot at it for a different type of syslog message. It may just be something coming from another application or a piece of hardware or some other, some other place where I want to process it a little differently. So I can clean out the grok parse failure tag and, and submit it back through the filter chain or down to a further filter. But in this case, let's assume that we got a, a good parse through here, and, and we now have a syslog message with those things. The next thing I want to do is decode that priority, which is the, the little bracketed 132 we saw in the previous message. Mm, there are some capabilities built into, sys, uh, into Logstash to do that natively. You just kind of tell it what the labels are that match to the different, uh, different log levels, and, and then it'll go back and, and, and tell you in a, it creates a couple fields that, that tell you what the log level and the, and the facility are. So um, out of that, I, I, get, you know, I get a nice uh, human readable version of, of what that 132 meant. The next piece that I'm going to do is, is to process the date. And I'm going to take that from my messages timestamp because I really want to know when the event occurred, not necessarily when it arrived at, at, the, um, at the R syslog uh, log stash you know, front door. Um, and uh, I'm, here, I, I've given the, the old way of doing that before I started playing with the, the new uh, templates in, in syslog. In this case, I'm parsing out what I, what I know the format to be for an OpenStack log message, and I'm removing my timestamp field because this puts it um, into a, into a, a, a log stash generated field. And, and the, the side effect, the negative uh, part of all this is that um, I have to be pretty confident that my whole lab environment is in, uh, is in UTC time zone. And, and, you know, it is most of the time, but you know, somebody builds a new system and forgets, and, and then you, you sort of have a skew of, of data that's going to make it really hard to correlate events. So getting that time zone into the timestamp is, is obviously critical. So uh, moving on, the next thing we want to do is handle that, that uh, syslog facility that was generated by the syslog PRI. And, and in this case, what I'm going to do is map that to the particular components that, that I'm capturing in my lab from OpenStack based on you know, what facility generated that log message. And, and so if you uh, have looked at the syslog specification, you're going to find that there are only seven, well, eight local uh, log levels or local facilities. And the, uh, so obviously this doesn't scale, which is why I was really excited about that, um, that updated uh, format and, and a little disappointed when I, when I couldn't get it to work right off the bat. Uh, and why it's also very important to me to get working because I have other products or projects that I want to incorporate into this, into this pattern. So for now it's okay. Um, later I'll have to come up with something else. Uh, the, Net effect of this is if it doesn't match one of those syslog facilities, I really don't know what it is with respect to OpenStack. I'm going to tag it as an unknown component. Otherwise, I'm going to tag the component as, as the one that it matched. And so the next thing I do is just sort of clean up and mutate a bunch of the fields. I want to rename you know, message to message, and I want to uh, rename you know, syslog host to host. It's a little more parsable and readable for for people who are who may be looking through the Elasticsearch or doing queries, writing queries, uh, getting rid of some fields that were just transient in my world, assuming we got to this point in the filter, and adding some tags to kind of give myself a sense of 
how this flowed through my filter chain. So at the end of this, I'll know that it completed processing. It was an OpenStack syslog, and it matched filter 34. It may go on to do other things. I may add, you know, I may pass it to another filter still, which I'll, which I'll go through in a second. But the net is, this is what I get in, in Elasticsearch. I get a message that I'm really happy with, and, you know, um, it's, a, it's a broad category of messages, but, you know, it's, it's distilled from, uh, from a, a sea of messages that could have contained everything uh, in the whole set of messages generated, including OpenStack. So, so a step in the right direction. So the next thing we'll do is, is take this and go, okay, now we know we have an OpenStack message. Can I make some sense out of it? There are some things that come through messages that, that kind of fit the profile of a metric. And in this case, it's an API call uh, against Nova. And, and what I might want to do then is, is start building um, some data to build a, a, a chart or a view of, of what the performance of the API is over time. So this pattern parses out a message and it, it, it assumes that you've, you've already, you're known as an OpenStack syslog message. And, and uh, then we can parse this a little further down into whether it was a git put post delete, you know, what its URI was, dot, dot, dot. Uh, effectively matching the event that gets logged in the API log for, for Nova. And our filtration, assuming we've passed the original filter 34, is really straightforward, right? All I want to do is clean up a bunch of stuff that's not relevant to building this chart. And uh, I mean, I could optionally leave it there. I'm going to tag it as a metric because sometimes I want to search through uh, Elasticsearch for just metrics, and uh, and I'm going to tell it which filter it passed. And now, you know, I've got something very specific to work with, right? I've got a uh, a, a syslog uh, message that we know is a metric that we know is related to a uh, an API called a Nova. It came from an IP address. It has a URI, and and I can work with that. So what do I do next, right? Next, I want to start querying for these things and, and making some sense out of, you know, out of them. So in this case, we've got a, an Elasticsearch query that gets you back the OpenStack logs that were, that were put in uh, via our first pass through filter 34. So we're saying that a query must match a time range. Uh, it must be a type of OpenStack log. And we're going to also aggregate um, these, these events into a date histogram so that I can build a nice chart of how many occurred at, at each time slice. So in, in this case, the, the time slice is, you know, 5,448 seconds. We'll, we'll see why it's that in a second, but, um, uh, but the net is, and, and I, I want to I generate an event for a slice that had no events in it, which is the min doc count equals zero. Uh, and I call that event by log level. I'm going to slice it that way so that I can filter on those things um, in a little bit. The Nova API stats query is, is a little more complex. Um, what I'm doing here is matching everything. I'm, again, looking for a time range, and I'm looking for component Nova. Um, I actually can submit the query against the uh, specify the document type on the, on the query call so I don't have it in here. Uh, I didn't need it in the other one if I built the, the construct or constructed the search properly in code, or properly, differently in code. Uh, uh, in this case, the assumption is that you're querying only the um, API stats. Uh, again, we're going to aggregate here. We're doing it based on date first. So I'm going to first get you know, all the events that occurred in a time slice. And then I'm going to do a sub-aggregation on each of those things and break them down into whether calls were successful, you know, 200 to 299, 300 to 399, you know, failed at 400 to 499 or, you know, or 500. So, so that I can get a good sense of the failure rate of my APIs. And finally, I'm going to uh, gather some extended statistics on these things so I can do min, max, average, and, you know, variance and all this kind of stuff that, that you might want to uh, incorporate into your chart. So that brings me to uh, a topic that has been near and dear to my heart for uh, the time since I joined Selenia. 
Um, we introduced this week a product called Goldstone. I've put the definition of Goldstone or the, or the origin of the term in here because everybody asks what it is. Um, and uh, the purpose of Goldstone is to you know, bring some of this data to light, uh, let you see these things, um, and, and uh, build up an operator's perspective of an OpenStack cloud. So uh, you can download that from our website, uh, register this week, it should be available next week, and, and start playing around with it. It's a, it's a free download at this point. Uh, and some of the things you'll see are the result of, of all the stuff we just walked through. So, so this is the log filtration query. Uh, you can see the different uh, log levels represented in there. Um, I didn't show you the part of the query because I was trying to conserve space that, that allows me to do the filtering on the log level, but fundamentally, if you click on one of those little boxes up in the legend, it'll filter out that type of log event. Uh, it will also rerun a query back on the Elasticsearch to, to refilter the table, and, and so you can get a good, uh, good view of things. And since that query was time-ranged, if you click on one of those data points in the chart, you'll range into that, that data point with a little margin on each side and, and go closer into the data, which helps you navigate closer to a potential problem in your environment, like that big red spike that re represents a bunch of errors that occurred one day. Um, the other type of thing that we're doing is the, is the metric uh, report. So the API report that, that we were doing, the API query that we were building, is uh, the top left chart. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the Nova API response time in, in my lab. <laughs> it's really spiky because the tasks that uh, generate some of the data are, are on my laptop, and sometimes I take the lab down for, for various reasons. So anyway, it's not always available. It's not a production facility. So um, there are some other metrics that Nova presents in logs that are really nice to pull out. The spawn rate over here, so I can see you know, how often VMs are spawning in my environment and, and how successful that is, uh, and, and resource consumption uh, across the different uh, the, the different re CPU memory and, and storage resources, those things are generated out of logs um, when you spawn a, new, uh, spawn a new VM. So you can scrape that out and kind of build a, uh, an assessment over the time slice and average it out or max it out to see, you know, depending on how you want to see things. So that's um, a little bit about what Project Goldstone is, is doing. And, and again, you can download that uh, from www.selenia.com. Uh, in the very short future. So that's it for me. My name is John Stanford. I, uh, I'm the VP of Development at Selenia. I'm happy to talk with, with folks. But before you go, I'd like to do something uh, for my wife, who's been patiently waiting for me to come home. Could you all wave and say, hi, Yaila? Thank you very much. And, and if there are any questions, I can take a few questions now, I believe. Let's see how we're doing on time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your. Th thank you. Thanks for your presentation. It was really good. For, oh. for your uh, configuration files on your log stacks, do you do all your inputs save like in one configuration file? Uh, for the log stash configuration, no. Actually, what I have is a series of files in the log stash configuration folder. And they process, uh, you know, they're set up a lot like Etsy init.d. So, so I have a 0, 01 input filter and, and a, you know, a 34, uh, sorry, input and a, and a 34 filter and 37 filter and, you know, on and on and on, down to outputs in the 60s and 70s, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. How is the Solinia, the tool which you showed, the logging displaying tool, different from Kibana? Um, so from my perspective, Kibana will give you a great deal of functionality um, in a limited set of visualizations. Um, so some of the things that I want to visualize uh, and, and provide in a, in a product um, it go beyond that, that visualization capability. And so rather than trying to do some things in Kibana and some things over here, um, I just chose to put them all into, into our product and, and you know, write our own visualization library. That's that that I can extend to do what I want to do. Thank you. You didn't think of uh, extending Kibana for that instead of writing a product? Uh, I did not think of extending Kibana for that. All right. 
I, I would think, I, I actually thought about it and I thought if Elasticsearch wants to extend Kibana for that, they should. <laughs> As you increase the amount of filters in your log stash configuration, did you notice any severe degradation in the message throughput? Can you speak up? I'm sorry, I'm having a As you increase the number of filters in your log stash configuration, did you notice any severe degradation? With if, I, if I heard you correctly, uh, are you asking about the performance impact of? A performance impact of? Uh, more log stash filters. More filters within log stash. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I, I suspect that I'll reach some point where the, the filters get you know, complicated enough that I'll want to find a, a, maybe a client side solution to processing out some of these filters. You know, distribute the load a little bit rather than having centralized, or uh, expand my my layer of log stash processors uh, to uh, you know to account for the load. What numbers did you see when your transactions per second? Uh, how many nodes in your cluster? So most of the most of this stuff has been running in my lab, and and I've been seeing somewhere around 10,000 messages a second, uh, and and that's easily you know easily enough for for my lab purposes. Can you share some of the reasoning behind um, choosing uh, log, uh, syslog type forwarding instead of uh, log stash forward or lumberjack? Yeah, I, I, well one, uh, uh, and probably most importantly, uh, is I wanted to minimize the footprint on the client side and the facility is already there and it does buffering and, and caching for, you know, for that stuff. It's a well tried and tested you know, tool. Um, and, and again, most importantly, I didn't have to put another piece of software on the, on the client side. Thanks. Uh, sorry, I was a bit late. Uh, you mentioned that we can try it. Uh, is, you have already released the code. We can try it if you want to. Can you share the slide or the link where you get it? S sorry. Uh, can we get this microphone turned up a little bit? I'm just having a difficult time hearing out of it. So I can speak loudly. So I was a bit late. Sorry. Uh, did you mention that we can try it? Uh, yes. So, so can you share the link where we can get? <laughs> uh, yes. Or after that. <laughs> Let me quick uh, see if I can do this. Um, Uh, somewhere under there will be a goldstone. I don't know the exact URL path. Is it slash goldstone? Okay. Right. It, registration today uh, will notify you when it's available. We just need to go back home and package it after the conference and, and make, it, uh, make it available for folks. What we plan to do is ship it as a VM so you can just drop it in your management tier, minimal configuration. Uh, you know, set up some credentials for API access and set up uh, your clients to ship logs back, and that should be all you really need to do. Hi. Is there any plan of uh, alerting mechanism to be incorporated in this one? Yeah, uh, for alerting? Yeah. yeah that's, that's a longer-term plan for Goldstone. So this is a, a 1.0 release for us, and we really wanted to get just the, you know, the basic uh, data capture and, and some, some reporting in place. But, but the longer term will be to you know, do some uh, analysis and, and, and you know, handling of, of known types of events and things like that. So future release. Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, um, uh, if your OpenStack is a, is a multi-node cluster, does your tool aggregate all of them and provide one dashboard, or is it per node basis? Okay, what, one more time, sorry. Okay, so if you have a multi-node cluster. Multi-node right, cluster, yeah. yeah. Does, it, does your tool aggregate all the logs into one and provide one dashboard? Y yeah, that's, that's the goal. So you set up every node in your, in your OpenStack cloud. So the controller, the compute nodes, the volume nodes, and you know, all that stuff, and they all get shipped back to the central location. Um, you know, the VM that we're shipping with 1.0 is, you know, it's a VM, right? It's not a scaled out solution for a giant production cloud, but the technology itself that we, you know, the technology that we've chosen should scale for that if built, you know, built a little differently, so which is something we'll be working on in the future. So another question is, um, does it help you with the root cause analysis if something goes wrong? You know, if you have like 10 node and you try to create one VM, right? And you don't know where the scheduler scheduled that one and it errors out and instead of going through 10 node logs to find out where exactly that VM was spawned and what the reason is. Yeah, I, um, I mean, so, so we don't have any, you know, 
any automated navigation to a root cause right, right now. But you know, if you go to the to the log chart, um, you know, you can quickly see a spike of events and, and drill in there, and that's going to that's going to bring those events into the table as you drill further and further down uh, to, you know, to sub-second if you need to. So then you can quickly see what hosts are participating. And right now, it's, it's really just the OpenStack layer. So um, it's not going to tell you a lot about networks and things like that. Um, can I ask one more question? I, so what is the licensing for the tool, the, the one that you have? Uh, licensing is proprietary for now, um, but it's free to use. So. Uh, you know, that's, that's the way we've chose to do 1.0. Um, 2.0 will reevaluate and, and see if it's uh, something we want to open source. Thank you. OK. Um, I was, the previous session I was in, they were talking about a tool called Elastic Recheck, which is mm. part of OpenStack Info. I was wondering, do you see that there seems to be a lot of overlap? Uh, you know about them? I, I, I don't. Um, are, they, are they focusing on OpenStack specifically, or are they just? OpenStack build and finding random occurrences that are very statistically low occurring, but mm. occur often enough. Yeah, interesting. I, I, I'm not familiar with it, um, but I would like to know more. So if you've got a second, I'd, maybe we can just write down the, the URL. OK, I'm going to wrap it up to let the next, uh, next person get the stage, uh, if there is such a thing. I didn't look at the schedule. But thank you all so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your summit.